typed in my the username once, so it saved it automatically. Go to games, number games, down to trash scene investigation, and it opens up, and you click start. All right, so we're going to start with collecting the evidence. And if you want to listen to all this, you can, Hello, but I'm, I'm going to skip the introduction. I'm that the Blue Chevy Cavalier was traveling north on County Road 27, and the Green Old Cavalero was traveling west on Gary Road. The first thing we need to do is start to gather physical evidence carefully and accurately. Everything we do can ultimately end up being defended in court, so you owe it to yourself, the patrol, and to the people who died here today to get it right. There is a lot of data that will be gathered here today by many different officers. I've already coordinated with the rest of the troopers here and know what data you will gather with my help. We'll start with the assessment of the vehicles involved. When looking over the cars, there is a check sheet we typically use. From this point forward, we will refer to the blue Chevy Cavalier as unit number one and the green Oldsmobile Alero as unit number two. Okay, while she's talking, I'm going to go over the answers to the um, first page because she talked for a little while here. So question number one, if it took you five minutes to read this, how many people were injured? So based on what we read, does anybody have an answer? Oops, hold on, there's people I need to invite, not let in. Hey guys. Okay, so All right, so who has an answer? Just call, call it out. So if you're just joining us, we're, we're just going over the answers on uh, the review questions on the first page. So if it took you five minutes to read this, you can use your hand to show me because I can't hear everybody. Anybody? Did anybody read it? Did anybody try this on their own yet? Okay, so if you go back to this very first page, the first paragraph, it's even underlined, it says, here's some people talking, but it's a little bit static -y. Um, So the first page, it says, that means that a person gets hurt in a motor vehicle accident about every 10 seconds. So if somebody gets hurt every 10 seconds, and it takes you five minutes to read, how many people were injured during the time we've been reading? 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. <laughs> so one person every 10 seconds means six people every every minute and five minutes. Six times five is 30. All right, so she's done talking. You guys are going to be responsible to read the rest of the page and answer those questions on your own. I just want to go over the Ed Heads part with you guys. So I'm going to unmute it again. All right, so we're all back here. The first page, the first one. I don't know if you guys can see this because I can't see what I'm looking at right now, but the evidence collection where it said blue, the blue car, right? Is everybody there? Okay, so what we do is we click on the car and then it tells us use the view button below to see each side of this unit, record any damage that you see by circling the appropriate description the damage areas section, page two and three of your printout. Once you've recorded the damage for both units, press continue. So we don't want to hit continue until we have all the information. So areas of vehicle damage. So the front damage. We circle everything. Is the front damage? Do we all think the front's damage? Hi guys, if you're joining us, welcome. We are on the first page where it says evidence collection for the blue car. All right, headlights. So we want to go back. Headlights are in the front of the car, so we're going to go back to the front. No, it's like there, but like it like that nothing like your mouse is like not moving. Oh, my mouse isn't moving. You don't see the mouse. No, I don't see you clicking. Oh, you don't see it moving around. Is that no. moving around? No. Oh. No. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. All right. So then, just yeah. as I'm saying what I'm clicking on, then click on it with your screen. Oh, 
from Jersey. Where is she? Ready? So I'm right now I'm looking at the, the windows and I click on the left side of the car. All right, since there are no windows in the back, we're going to say the rear left. All right, that's all I got. Okay. And the oh, right oh. is damaged. I only have four fingers. And the what is also damaged? The rear, both rears are damaged because there's no windows there at all. That's on your own. Um, damage severity. Do you think that they're able to drive it away? Is it functional or non-functional? Any want to answer? Functional or non-functional? What page are we on? We're on the second page where it says the green Oldsmobile evidence collection. Uh. All right, so I'm going to say that it's non-functional. The damage scale would be pretty heavy. Not able to drive it. Headlight. We're going to look at the front again. Headlights, I don't see any headlights, so they're both damaged. Front tires. Uh, let me look to the left. The front left tire is damaged. Let's look at the right. Uh, that's hard to tell if the right one's damaged or not. <laughs> so you can write that it's damaged or not damaged. It doesn't matter. Rear tires. Looks like both rear tires are okay. So I'm going to say no damage. Windows. So we're going to look at the front again. Windshield. Looks like it's in cast. The right rear windows are okay. Left windows are all okay. The rear windows are okay. So it looks like all the windows are okay. This one was probably just rolled down. So I'm gonna say that there's no damage to windows. Did the vehicle drive away or remain at the scene? still there, so obviously they remained at the scene. And this one does not have that fire retardant spray around it, so there was no fire. All right, so I'm gonna hit continue. Now we need to take a look at the evidence on the road and see what it tells us. Recording and measuring evidence like skids, scrapes, and debris will help us form a more complete picture of what happened and will hopefully help us figure out what caused this crash. Logically, what's the best way to proceed with this investigation? All right, so should we start at a point of impact? Should we start in the middle and then work in both directions? Start with uh, what the eyewitnesses told you or start from the final resting place? What do you guys think? B? B? B. 
As in, like, Bumblebee. Bumblebee? We should start in the middle and work in both directions? Oh, Bumblebee. Yep. Okay. You'll have a hard time doing it that way. Right. Sorry. So what other, what other guesses do we have? Sorry. <laughs> D. All right, D. That's correct. All right. We'll start working our way backwards from the car's final resting place to the oh. we think impact occurred. We will measure almost everything we see and record all information in our crash report. Whatever we don't measure will be measured by another patrol officer. I strongly encourage you to make your own sketch of the scene using the crash scene diagram template found in your crash report printout on page four. This will help you get a better idea of how and where the accident happened. Okay, so before you do anything, we are going to draw out, because I think they're gonna disappear, all those, um, all these skid marks. We wanna draw the skid marks and the debris here. So just do a rough draft drawing really quick. To draw this? Yeah. And you wanna to try to make sure the skid marks line up with where the tires are. Okay, so it's just the four lines and the debris here. A little annoying because the cards aren't exactly the same. Okay, I'm going to hit continue. Start by tracing back unit one, the blue Chevy. Click all the skids and scrapes associated with this unit, starting with the car and going back to what you believe might be the point of impact. All right, so use your mouse to click any skid mark or scrape you think were a part of the unit. If your skid or scrape shows up in blue, then you're correct. But if it's green, then it belongs to the other car. And then we want to take note. So this one, it's like it goes to this tire, the top one. So I'm going to click on that, and it's blue. This one looks like it goes, hmm. both of these are past the car, past the green car. So oh, that was a green one. So that second line is green. So first is blue, second's green. This other skid mark here, this white one, is blue. And then this last one is green. So I just look, I don't think you can see what I wrote, but. I just wrote little little notes on top of each skid mark that I drew, and I wrote blue, green, blue, green. All right, so I'm going to hit continue. The highway patrol will be recording a lot of measurements. All the evidence will be labeled with letters to keep everything straight. For now, we will just label the evidence that we're dealing with. Another trooper is measuring the skids for unit one. Now that we've decided which evidence belongs to which car, we'll begin by labeling unit two. Unit 2 was pulled back so emergency personnel could get to the people in Unit 1. However, we can still tell the location where Unit 2 came to rest, as it was still connected to Unit 1 when the car stopped moving. On the crash scene diagram page of the printout, label the front tires of Unit 2, G, for the left front, and H, for the right front. Following the skin marks in the grass, determine where the front right tire, H, left the road. Label this location, J. Using your measurement tool, measure and record the distance between H and J, remembering to follow the curve of the skid mark. All right, so mark all these letters down where you uh, drew your skid mark. So make sure you have the H, the G, and the J all, all recorded. So we're going to draw a line. Oh, that's the last one. <laughs> All right, so do we all have our letters written down. I'm going to hit continue. Oh, wait. Okay, they're still there. So I'm just going to draw my line. So I'm going to connect from A to the middle of it. To J. And 
All right, so it looks like it's 20 plus 22 feet from H to J. So what does that equal? 40, 42. 42 feet total. So we're going to record that. See at the bottom it says most H to J blank feet. We're going to write 42 feet down there. Okay, now I'm going to hit continue. Did we all write 42? Yes. Yeah. What was the distance between H and J? Write it down. Okay, Following that. skid marks in the grass, determine where the front left tire, G, left the road. This location will be labeled F. So now measure and record the distance between G and F. Okay, so now we're going to record G to F. So record F, write F down. I'm going to do the same thing, so I'm bringing My points down, so I have 24 plus 25 equals 49. 49. What was the second one? Oh, uh, we're going back to that one. Oh. Thank you for pointing that out. Make sure you put it in the right place. All right, so I'm going to hit continue. Good work. Before we do that, it is fairly clear that the back tires of Unit 2 did not leave skid marks on the road. Why do you think that is the case? All right, both tires were bald. They are made from a new kind of rubber. They were new tires, or the tires were most likely still rolling normally. What do you guys think? Call out a letter. D. E. Go ahead and observation. Following the skid mark from label J, turn <laughs> the front right tire skid mark begins. The starting location will be labeled I. What is the distance between J and I? Record the measurement. Okay, so we're going from J to I, so that's where your second um, line is down there with the notes. All right, J to I. I'm seeing 22 plus 30 feet. 52. 52, good. Next, follow the skid marks labeled and determine where the front left tire skid mark begins. This starting location will be labeled E. Measure and write down the distance between F and E. All right, so F right here. 22. All right, so 22 and 27. 49. 49. All right, I'm going to continue. Okay, there's another scrape in the road closer to the intersection, which we will label C. Looking right, at the um, relative position of the physical evidence, which car do you think made this scrape? So who made this uh, the scrape? One or two? Blue or green? One. You think one did? None. Two, two, two. Yeah, two. It lines up with that mark we were just right. connecting. This scrape is outside or farther south of the skid made by the right front tire of unit one, so could not have gone from that car. Another trooper has measured this scrape. Given that unit one was heading north and that unit two was heading west, it is most likely that crash occurred at or near the intersection. Look for fresh gouges in the road or skid marks. Do you see something that looks like a possible effect? Click on that point. All right, so. Great. The debris of what looks like headlights supports your conclusion. We will label this A on our diagram. Now, do you see other evidence near the impact point that might be important? If so, click on it. No. Um, Good observation. We will label the small skid mark B. Having seen the location and relative positions of the cars after the accident, what do you think the small mark might be? All right, what do you guys think this mark is? Is it the skid from unit one? Is it the skid from the right tire? Skid from the left tire of unit one? Or this kid from unit two pulling on its brake, putting on its brake. 
it's not the bricks because it kept going. Okay, so what letter do you want to say? Uh, actually, uh, probably like C or B. Take another look at where this is in relation. Take another look at where nope. this is in relation. Right? All right, it was I B. I can tell you are really <laughs> thinking about this. If we think we've covered the evidence thoroughly, let's go interview our witnesses. All right, witness time. It looks like our fellow officers have determined that there were two witnesses to the crime. I'm going to skip the intro. All right, so we're going to record whatever questions they Mr. are asking. Seymour, thanks for staying here so we could talk to you. Where were you when the accident occurred? All right, so we're going to write this down. This is the first question we're asking, witness number one. Right, we're on the next page. Witness interview, uh, interview witness statement. I was traveling south on 27. I was not yet to the end of that fence there. Okay, so he's traveling south toward the end of the fence. With the where were we? Uh, we're on the next page where it says witness number one, interview witness statements. And his question was, where were you? So was the officer asked. And he said that he was traveling south and he was at the end of the fence. Okay, I'm gonna hit continue. Uh-huh, what did you see? Yep, all right, so what did you see? I saw the blue car at the stop sign. It started forward and the next thing I saw was the green car hit the blue car. Oh, it was horrible. And both cars started skidding sideways. All right, so the blue car was at the stop sign, it traveled forward, and then the green car hit the blue car. So the green car hit the blue car. How fast did you say the green car was going? It looked like a normal speed. Normal speed. What happened after the impact? I drove as quickly as I could to the place the cars ended up. The two people in the green car got out. Uh, they, they were in pretty bad shape. One fell down almost immediately. Uh, I think the driver, the other was leaning against the car. I smelled smoke. So I tried to get the driver of the blue car out. Uh, I couldn't get the seatbelt undone. So I, I cut it with my knife. I, I pulled him out, but he didn't have a pulse. I, I was getting afraid the fire might cause an explosion. So I felt for a pulse on the second guy in the car. There wasn't one. So I tried to get to the girl. She had a little pulse, but I couldn't get her out. I just couldn't get her out. It seemed like forever, but I guess it was probably only a few minutes before the first highway patrol car showed up. He sprayed foam around and put out the fire. And then he called in the life flight helicopter and the EMTs who started tearing the car up to get to the girl. All right, so whatever notes you took on that is fine. So he said that he drove to the cars, the two people in the green car got out, the blue car driver was leaning on the steering wheel. Uh, he smelled smoke. He tried to cut the blue car driver out. There was no pulse. The other passenger had no pulse in the blue car. The girl, he couldn't get out. She had a little bit of a pulse. All right, last one. Was there any other traffic on the road that you saw? No. But uh, honestly, I, I was so shocked. I wasn't paying too much attention after the accident. There could have been cars on 27. Uh, I'm not sure I would have noticed. What do we put for that? No, not really? You can write maybe. Um, oh, sorry. Well, he didn't notice any, but maybe on 27. All right, so we're moving on to the next witness. Well, thank you, Mr. Seymour. We appreciate your help. Can you give us contact information if we have further questions for you later? Yeah, sure. While I get his contact information, you decide which questions below are important to ask Mrs. Harvis. 
Remember, you don't want to waste the time on insignificant details, but you do want to get all the information pertinent to this scene. All right, so we'll just go in order. She'll just tell us if she doesn't want to answer the question. I was going north on County Road 27 and saw a blue car stopped at the stop sign. Like, I guess I was about 100 feet or so behind it. What's the, what's the question that we chose? All right, so where were you when the accident occurred? I'm just going to go down the list in order. And what'd you say? She was headed north on 27. The blue car was stopped at the stop sign. He was 100 feet behind. Okay, so I'm going to ask, what did you see? I was slowing down for the stop sign, and the blue car was pulling forward. I didn't see the green car coming, but all of a sudden it slammed into the blue car and started pushing it sideways. There was a horrible noise at impact, and then a screeching noise as the cars moved down Gary Road together. Okay, so the blue car was moving forward, green car came out of nowhere. And hit blue car. All right, were there any obstructions on the road? Not before the accident, no. Well, not that I saw. Well, no obstruction. Wait, no Color. The number three is, were, uh, were there any obstructions in the road? And she said no. What's obstruction? Um, like an obstacle, like something in the road that would have caused, that could have caused an accident. All right, so what color is the car you were driving? Would that matter? Why would you want to know that? All right, so we don't need to do number four. Don't write number four down. All right, number five. Was there anything that prevented you from seeing the green car? There were all these plants to the right of my car. The plants are kind of high. That's probably what prevented me from seeing the green car. So there were plants, high plants. All right, what speed were you Why going? Why you want to know that? Does not matter. Number seven, what speed do you think the green car was well, going? I didn't really see it before it hit the blue car, so I can't really say. I was so shocked. It was just horrible, but I thought it important to help those poor people. I, I didn't really feel there was much I could do to save them, but I called 911 on my cell phone and drove around the corner to see what I could do. Well, there was another do. man there trying to get the passengers out of the blue car. He looked as shocked as I felt, and I could tell by looking at him that the passengers were in pretty bad shape. It, it was only a few minutes before the first highway patrol cars came. But I tell you, I'll have nightmares about this for a long time. Thank you, Mrs. Arliss. Please write down contact information. Good job, rookie. We're finished collecting the evidence you were assigned. We'll start our reconstruction. Okay, so the next page. I'm just going to mute you for a minute. The next page is uh, witness information that was already given to you. So we don't need to do that. So flip to the worksheet calculations now. All right, I'm going to switch. This question was, um, what happened after the crash? So she called 911. She drove around the corner to help, and there was already another man helping. All right, so let's move on to worksheet calculations. I'm going to skip the intro. We don't need to hear her talking. What you want to do is start building a picture of what happened based only on the physical evidence the highway patrol gathered. There are a number of ways to do this, but I usually start with the post-collision speeds of both cars. We will start with Unit 1. We're looking for the post-collision speed. However, remember it was on both asphalt and on grass, so we'll calculate the speed on both surfaces. 
Let's calculate the post-collision speed when the car was on the asphalt using this equation. Speed equals the square root of 30 times distance times drag factor times percentage of braking. Refer to equation number one on your printout. The first part we can solve for is the variable d, or distance. For this calculation, though, we are using the center of mass of the vehicle, not the location of the tires. See where I've put a large x connecting the tires? Make your measurements from the center of that x. Measure and enter the distance d. This distance will be from the center of mass at the impact point of unit one to the center of mass at the edge of the road. Okay, so we're just doing the asphalt right now. And since we're not doing the tires, it's gonna be slightly different than what it was before. So we have 55. 103. 103? Yeah. And then you're gonna put that in number one. So it's 103 feet. So I'm gonna hit continue. To solve for F, look up the drag factor in the test skids section of your printout from the That's skid test taken to on Perry Road. Find and use the drag factor these troopers recorded in your equation. To solve for percent braking, N, we have to take into account that on Unit 2, the bumper came down and flattened its front tires, which equals 40% braking. Unit 1 was being pushed sideways, which is considered 100% braking. To get our final number, we average the two percentages, 40 plus 100 divided by 2. Take the result and use that number in place of N in your equation. Remember to put a decimal before your percentage number. Great. Now you have enough information to solve for Unit 1's post-collision speed on asphalt. All right, so all we had to do here was change to the distance we just did. Was it 103? Um, the drag factor. It's already given to you, 0.717, and the percent breaking was 0.7. So don't hit continue. Down here is our speed. You guys all see that? So the speed that you're going to record in SA in that box where it says MPH afterwards is going to be 39.38. We all see that? So it's still under number one. Now I'm going to hit continue and we're going to find the distance on the grass now. Now we need to calculate the post-collision speed for unit one on the grass. Again, refer to equation number one on your printout. Let's fill in those variables. D is the distance. Measure and record the distance of the skid on the grass using the center of mass. Mark, we're on the worksheet calculation page. All right, so we have 21 plus 25 46. To solve for F, we're going to use a number the Highway Patrol has researched for the drag factor on grass, which is 0.45. The braking percentage N will remain the same as our previous equation, 0 0.70. Good job. Now you have enough information to solve for Unit 1's post-collision speed on grass. All right, so our speed is down here, 20.84 miles per hour. Now that we have our unit one speeds on asphalt and grass, we're going to round them down and calculate the combined speed loss over the two surfaces. Refer to equation number two, combined asphalt and grass speed on your printout, which is SC equals the square root of SA squared plus SG squared. Take your first number, the speed of unit one on asphalt, and round down to the nearest whole number. This number will represent SA. 39. Okay, so 39 and... Take your second number, the speed of unit one on grass, and round down to the nearest whole number. This number will represent SG Now type your numbers into the equation to get SC, which represents the combined speed. So 39, and I'm gonna say 
I'm going to round up to 21 for this one. And our speed is 44.29. I can't highlight it for you, but you can see it down there. Can I continue? Around your answer down to the nearest full number to get the overall speed of unit one as it moved over two surfaces. But I sure hope you got around 43 miles per hour as your answer. 44, so close, good. If we really wanna know what happened during this accident, why are we rounding down and using the minimum post collision speeds? No, that's why we're supposed to round down. That's why it wasn't 30, 21, sorry. Um, can you read B and C? I can't really see it. B is so that the defense attorney can't argue that we increase the speed, or and C is because that's the mathematically correct thing to do. Great job. So it's B. Take a look at the combined post collision speed we have for two cars. They should be 43 and 44 miles per hour, respectively. This makes sense given the final location of the two cars and that Unit 2 is really the force moving Unit 1 after the crash. For future calculations, we will use 43 miles per hour as the post-collision speed for these two vehicles. Make sure you record this speed in the worksheet section of your printout. Both S3 and S4 will equal 43. Okay, so I'm just right making a note, 43 miles an hour for post-collision speed is what we're gonna use. We're gonna continue. Next, we need to determine what the approach speeds of both vehicles were to see how fast they were going before colliding. In order to do this, we need some more information from our printout under the vehicle weights taken at scene section. Right, so we you... have to determine the total weight of each car. The four axles of each car have been weighed on highway patrol portable scales. These scales are small enough to fit into the trunk of a patrol car, but are not big enough to weigh the entire car at one time. So we will add the weight of the four axles to determine the total weight of each of the cars. What is the total weight of unit one? All right, so if what you is flip the total the page, weight of unit two? Write those weights down in the worksheet section of your printout. Okay, flip the page and it says vehicle weight taken at the scene. And if you add up all of unit one, I'm getting 2,940. And unit two. Sorry, I'm still adding. It is 3,000. Wait, so, wait, where are we putting this? So just if you flip over to the next page, it says vehicle weight taken at scene. You see that? Uh, On the next page, the back of the page. Yeah. Okay, so you're just going to, if you add up all the weight, the left front, the right front, the left rear, the right rear, for vehicle one, unit one, it was 2,940. So I just wrote that number down below it. And unit two was 3,000. So if we go back to the first page, asking W1 in that box, the table, the W1 weight of unit. So we're writing 2940. W2 weight of unit is 3,000. All right, so we all have that written down? Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna continue. Next, we will look at approach and departure angles. For this crash, we already know the angles of approach. For the purposes of this calculation, unit one will be at an approach angle of zero, and unit two will be at 90 degrees. Write those angles down in the worksheet approach angle section of your printout. All right, so A1 is zero zero degrees, and A2 is 90 degrees. Sorry, what was, the, what, was the, what was the weight of unit two again? The weight of unit two is 3,000 pounds. Got it, you can continue now. Sorry, Josh. Crash. So a single post-collision angle will be measured. Measure the angle the cars traveled after the collision. Record the same angle for both Unit 1 and Unit 2 in the worksheet post-collision angle section of your printout. All right, so post-collision, we just line it up with this line. And... Let's see how many angle it is on. 
Wait, what are we? Or adding what? Um, I think we're just supposed to write down the 264. I just took that arrow. Do you guys see what I did? Oh, yes. All right, so I lined the arrow up with the red line. So I'm at 264 degrees. Yeah. All right, so now post angle You two. should now have the weight, post collision speed, approach angle, and post collision angle for both vehicles. Uh oh. Will we use the following? I didn't get to. Under equations to calculate the approach speed well, on the A4. for S2. Using right, the numbers on your worksheet, plug the appropriate variables into this equation to get unit two's approach speed. Oh, wait, so, so A3 and A4, it was 90, then 264? A2 was 90, A3 was 264. Um, I'm trying to figure out what, well, maybe they both were 264, because it was after collision, so they are the same. All right, so W1, so now we're just going to plug in all the numbers. So W1 is 29, sorry. Four, four, zero. S3, post collision speed is going to be 43. Uh, A3 is 264. W2 is 3000. And A2 is 90 plus S4 is 43 and A4 to 64. All right, so we're saying that S2, see it's still in the table. So S2, the approach speed of unit two was 84.67 miles per hour. Well, what was the approach speed of S1? Uh, we haven't calculated that yet. This is just the approach speed of unit two. This is what we're calculating right now. So we went ahead a little bit? Um, it's just skipping, so it's doing unit two first, and then we should be able to do unit one. All right. But you know what, just to double check. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to switch it up. All right, so we have 84.67 miles an hour for unit two. I'm going to go on. 4.6. Write your number on the S2 line of your question. Keep in mind that this is the minimum speed unit two could have been going as we rounded down every chance we had. To calculate the approach speed for unit one, we will use equation number four on your equations page of the printout. Using the numbers on your worksheet, plug right, the appropriate so variables into this equation to get unit one's approach speed. S3 was 43, A3 is 264, A1 is zero, W2 is 3000, S4 is 43. A4 is 264, A2 is 90, W1, W1, 2940, A1, 0. All right, so we have uh, S1, the approach speed of unit one was 9.08 miles per hour. Okay, we good? Yes. All right, I'm going on. Now write that approach speed on the S1 line of your worksheet. We've looked extensively at what happened to the vehicles in this crash, but the important part is the people. Three people died, and this impacted untold numbers of family members, classmates, and friends. To learn more about what happens to someone in a car crash, let's take a look at the forces that were impacting the people in these two vehicles. We can't know exactly what happened, 
but we can calculate approximately what forces would have been acting on the people at a given time. Keep in mind that if the body is moving faster or is bigger, there is more force exerted on it. If the collision is stretched out over time, there is less force exerted. Stopping distance must be estimated based on the circumstances of the damage to be studied. Changing the stopping distance by even a small amount can drastically change the force experienced by each person involved in the crash. The passengers in Unit 1, despite their seatbelts, experience a rapid side acceleration after being hit by Unit 2. That rapid acceleration of 0 to 43 miles per hour occurs over a very short distance, probably around 0.2 feet. This roughly equals a velocity of 63 feet per second. The driver of Unit 1 weighed 205 pounds. Calculate force on him just after impact using this equation. Number 5, force of impact on your printout. All right, so driver 1 weight was 205. The distance D was 0.2. So you guys see we're on the next table? And the velocity was 63 feet per second. So for a 205 pound driver, um, there was a 63171 pounds of force. Sixty three thousand seven one hundred and seventy one pounds of force for um, 205 pounds for a 200 everything stays the same we're just going to change that change the 205 to 200 so we have 60,630 pounds of force if we have somebody that was 110 what was the what was you what was the second one 61,630 For the 110 pound person, we have 33,896. For 180, we have 55,267. For 150, 46, 222. What was the first one? What? What was the first and second one? The first, first one was 63,171. The second was 51,630. 51? 61. Sixth one. So, so what were the last two? The last two? Yeah. Fifth, so uh, 180 pounds was 55,467 and for 150 pounds was 46,222. 222? Yeah. And last question, what was S3 like above? I didn't hear that one. Uh, 43. Thank you. All right, so now, are you guys all following along with me while I'm doing this? Because if you have this open, you're supposed to put your weight in. So if you weigh 130 pounds, anybody weigh 130 pounds? Anyone need me to put their numbers in for them? Call out a weight if you need me to put it in for you. Or text the weight. I hear someone trying to talk, but I can't. 160. 160? All right, 160 is 49,304. What was the 200 pound one? 200 was 61,630. Anybody need Elsie me to put in their weight for them? 125. 125? Yeah. 125 is 38,519. Well, what was the one? 
for um, unit to 150 pounds? 46,222. 46,222? Yes. Got it. All right, so now... <laughs> I'm not sure what that word said. Oh, falls. Falls are more than 20 feet are potentially fatal. Does anybody have any other parts for the uh, questions for the forces impacting people? We're all good. I can move on. Wait, what about the unit, like the drive, the how many feet equals the force of the driver unit one? Did we do that yet? For the, the pre fall one? Uh, the last two questions on yeah, that page. We didn't do that one yet. I'm going to take you continue. You've got around 63,000 pounds of pressure. You're right. And that's more than enough force to cause that. Using the same equation, try changing the weight to represent other passengers' force of impact. Our other front passenger weighs 200 pounds, and the back seat passenger weighed 110 pounds. Okay, we already did that. The people that. in Unit 2 experienced a much different situation from those in Unit 1. The driver and passenger, wearing seat belt and seats with impacting airbags, stopped over a much larger distance compared to the 0.2 feet experienced by the passengers in Unit 1. The distance for Unit 2 was probably around 1.5 feet. Calculate the forces experienced by the 180-pound driver of Unit 2 using a stopping distance of 1.5 feet. All right, so we actually did all for the, the one before. You guys see that? So go back up to unit two. We're gonna change those numbers. So 180 velocity is 63 distance one. It's a what was unit one? All right, so we're at unit two actually. All right. I didn't realize that they're all different. All right, so unit two for 180, it's a different force. So just cross off what you already have. We're changing it to 7,395. And then for 150, it's 6,163. All right, so now, I'm gonna change the uh, the weight. So 125, I forgot who said they were 125, but your force was 5,135 pounds of force. 160 is 6,573 pounds of force. Anybody need me to put a different weight in for themselves? All right, so unit two, I'm going back over unit two again. What we should have written down for the first one, 180 pounds, was 7,395. For unit two, for 150 pounds was 6,163. And then if your computer screen's open, you should be putting in your own weight. All right, so now I'm gonna hit continue. Anybody have questions? So we're moving on to the um, Sorry, hold on. 300 pounds of pressure. You're right. This is a much less severe and life-threatening amount of force to put on this passenger, which is probably why he lived. Can I ask that passenger question? weighed in at hold 150 on. pounds. Try adjusting the equation for that weight to see what force was applied. All right, say that again, Manoli. You just had a question. Uh, so we're going on to the free fall? Yeah. So those are some pretty high numbers, but much lower than for unit number one. However, it's hard to envision what that kind of force really means. For comparison, the force of 150-pound person would experience falling flat onto a hard surface from various heights is given in this visual. Find each crash victim's force at impact and compare this to the data about heights. Then think about who survived and who didn't. Generally, falls of more than 20 feet are considered potentially fatal falls. All right, so 20 feet are fatal falls. I'm gonna drop to try to find, we wanna to try to get about um, 
for unit one, we're around 63,000. All right, so 20 foot is only 15,000 pounds of force. So this is why obviously everybody in unit one dies. Okay, so we're at 30 pounds of force at 30 feet. Forty-five thousand. All right, so I'm gonna say it's around eighty-five feet, literally like eighty-three feet, is what uh, unit one experience falling from eighty-three feet. And then unit two is 7,000. All right, so it's less than 10 feet. All right, so the a fall of how many feet? So driver one, or unit one was 83 feet, and unit two was less than 10 feet. All right, we don't need anything. Don't need to fill in anything on the next page. And then we're on our last page. So Ari, what was, what was the force of the driver on unit two for the following dummy thing? Unit two was less than 10 feet. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, so what conclusions can we draw? I'm gonna hit continue to see what it tells us. We have now completed now. the calculations to reconstruct what occurred, basing them on physical evidence and physics. Look at the data that both you and other troopers gathered and draw your conclusions by answering the following questions. All right, so do you think that unit one stopped at a stop sign? Did the blue cars actually stop at the stop sign like people said they, they did? No. He was only driving eight miles an hour when he got hit. It didn't stop. Yes, he did. He's driving eight miles an hour. So, right, yes? Yeah. come to a complete. So, question one is yes. Number two, is there any evidence the driver of unit two applied his brakes before impact? No. No? Number three. Were there obstructions in the road or obstructions to the sight line that could have contributed to the crash? Was there anything that would have maybe no. prevented the green car from seeing the blue car? No. Not the big trees? Yes. <laughs> so yes. Remember the witness said that there are trees and she couldn't see the green car coming. What was question two? Two was no. All right, four. We were supposed to come to a complete stop eight miles still going though. Well, yeah. But he didn't have a stop he didn't have a stop sign to stop at. Oh. So I don't I, I don't know what they're going to say whose fault it actually was because the blue car should have looked both ways and they should have seen the other car coming but with the trees in the way. Maybe it was the blue car's fault. All right, question four is not this answer. Uh, how many feet ahead? Okay. 380. Feet ahead, could unit two see the intersection that unit one was coming from? What do you guys think? C. C? 380? Ah. All right, well, it wasn't 380. <laughs> um, it would have been 260. B. That's on the page before if you read the description. Uh -oh. All right, tire analysis of the vehicle indicates that um, 
the accident could have been avoided with proper inflation of the tire. Unit one had bald tires. All tires on both vehicles seem to be in an acceptable condition. The tire sizes were wrong. What do you guys think? I'm going to go with C. Five. Okay, but that, that wasn't one of the questions that I asked you anyway. So um, okay, this one is one. So analysis of the question evaluation for unit one indicates flash heads are driven into the passenger at impact. If the car met required safe standards, no one would have died. The seat belts in unit one were faulty, or the car must meet safe standards of oh, the car met safe, uh, required safety standards. I'm going to go with D. Both cars were good. The driver of unit two reported he was only going 55. Do you agree with his statement? Was driver two only going 55? No. No, he was like 83. Water. So that's Q6. Question seven. If you had is this one? All right, this one doesn't matter. If you were to charge one of the drivers, who would it be? Who do we want to say? Is that false? Excessive speed. B, yeah. So he was going way over the speed limit, which is why he couldn't stop. Wait, I don't um, see that question. Let's one of the paper. questions on the thing. Don't, don't have to do it. If you had to say yeah. that there was one primary con con yeah, contributing factor to this accident, what was the factor? Speed? That's speed. Yeah. Okay, so that's A. Um, if you were lesser, okay, so what lesser contributing factor to the accident would have been? What's the other fault? B. B. B? The post. No, C. C. Oh, C. C. Vegetation. Okay, good. Yeah, C. Utility pole and vegetation blocked the view. Uh, question nine. Two people in unit one died within seconds of the accident. The third, uh, the third died shortly after. What killed the people? It's either C or B. The force. Yeah, the force. The, the force killed them. Next page. Um, why did the people in Unit 2 survive? They saw what was about to happen. They continued to drive in the same direction after the impact. They were saved by the EMT first. Much of their height, a higher body weight. So. B, right? Yeah, B. Thanks for helping us reconstruct this crash scene. Yes, you've done a great job. The driver of Unit 2, while only 18 years old, had the responsibility to operate his vehicle in a safe and legal manner. He made a poor choice, and as a result, three people are dead in both he and the passenger's engine. In your opinion, there are very few things worth dying for. I wonder if this driver thought getting somewhere faster was worth the price. He's looking at anywhere from 18 months to five years of prison and a substantial monetary fine. So instead of going to college as he planned, he's spending those years in prison. Does this make you stop and think about the driving choices you make? Uh, all right, so momentum. Who remembers what the equation for momentum is? Oh, no. Velocity times the mass, right? So unit one weighed 2,940 pounds times its velocity. Unit one was the blue car. Where am I looking? Uh, okay, so unit one was Nine point zero eight. 
What did you get? I got this. It's on the screen. Oh, you're not, I can't see you right now, but you're right. So it's 26,695.2 is the unit one's momentum. And the momentum of unit two is going 84.67. So 3,000 times 84.67, 254,010. With 254,010. Yeah. First one. So based on these momentum, did anybody need me to say those numbers again? Yeah, what was the momentum of unit one? Unit one was 26,695.2. Unit two was 254,010. So looking at those momentums, why would the car have been, why did both cars end up where they were, where they did post collision? Because they hit each other? Well, which way did they travel? The way Unit 2 was going or the way Unit 1 was going? Unit 2, because you were going faster. Right, so Unit 2 had more momentum, so Unit 2, it continued in the way Unit 2 was going. Had Unit 2 been driving slower, explain what would have uh, been different about the accident. Um, they wouldn't have been such a high impact and they probably would have died. Okay. You guys can really put anything here at all. So if it was going to speed limit, it might not have happened at all. Um, or the impact may not have been as severe. People may have survived. Question 14. What? I'm 12. Number 12, uh, the unit had more momentum. Unit, you hear me, Emma? Okay. Okay, unit two had more momentum. All right, question 14. <laughs> You're welcome. Why did you need to calculate a different post collision speed for grass and different post? Collision speed for asphalt. What would, have, why, what would have been different about the grass and the asphalt? What's that F word that we've started learning about? I thought I was going to say friction, but. Yep, different amount of friction. They both would have caused different friction. Oh, you said F? I thought you said S word. I was oh, like, F. Wait, what? <laughs> no, F. You're right. Good. So if you were to charge one of the drivers with a violation, who would it be and why? Unit two, because he was going to excess the speed. Good. Perfect. So unit two, because he was going excessive speed. He was going too fast. Those last two pages, you're using the packet that I gave you in class, our garbage, the boat design challenge. So if you didn't finish that first page, what? Wait, what, what, what do we have to finish? The last two pages, the boat design challenge, where we don't need to do that. Yeah. Okay, so if you didn't finish the crash scene investigation first page, where you just had to read that paragraph, or those two paragraphs and answer questions, do that, take pictures of all your work, and then submit it, and then you guys are done for today's work. Right. That's it for day three. This is that was it for this is three four. So the only other thing that you guys have right now to work on for me is the um, second gizmos, and then you guys are done. Five wars. What, John? It's sled wars. Yes. Sled wars. Gizmos. 
Um, if you want, I could do another Zoom maybe on Wednesday for that. Or maybe I should do a Zoom for the, the um, yeah. right, maybe I'll do the sled wars tomorrow and then I could do an uh, open question Zoom. I don't know what to do yet. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll post something to let you guys know when I'm I was going to say that we could do them from the, the card lab. What? Say that again? I was going to say from the card lab, but that was day two. I posted, I posted a video of myself uh, doing all the questions for the card lab. So that's already online. All the math questions, I already posted. Like, the and for, the, like, for the actual lab Oh, uh, we're not going to do it until we're in school. But you yeah, also do that the, first thing. The, the, the actual thing. Do we have to do anything else? The, the only other oh, thing okay. you can turn in is the gizmos. And then you need to study all the math problems because you're going to get a test next week on the math. Alright. Alright, anybody have any questions? I missed four and five for the witness two. The questions for witness two? Yeah. All right, four question was, was there anything preventing you from seeing the green car? And the answer was that there were high plants. I had a question on question 12 of the quiz. Why did the cars end up graded post pollution? Wait, I didn't I didn't hear that. Let me do number five really quick. Yeah. Five was what speed was the green car going and she said I can't say. What was five? Five was what speed was the green car going? She said I can't say. She couldn't see it so she didn't know. All right, say the question again about the quiz or the test. Why did the cars end up with a good post conclusion without the question on the quiz? Josh, is that, is that you asking it? Yep. You're breaking up a lot. Would you be able to email me the question? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Anybody have anybody else have questions? Yeah. No. So for like, the third part, evidence collection. Yeah. I missed like the four, like four of the first ones. Okay, I'm gonna post the video. This video of what we just did online. Okay. All right. So you'll be able to access. Just fast forward to where we did the evidence collection, and then you have to watch the whole thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. All right, so I'm going to sign off now and try to get this video uploaded. Anybody have anything else? No, thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Have a good day. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye. Well, thank you.